Hi, hello, today is Friday and I am PA and I'm representing the company named Handle It Handbags. The reason for the name actually is because we name our handbags after women of color. Handle it girl, because that's just what they wind up doing in society or they have previously. So, what we're going to do today, we're talking about a sister by the name of Ellen Craft. But what we're going to do at first is we're going to welcome you, ask you to register or subscribe, we'll say, for our, our wonderful conversation that we have every Friday. And what we do is talk about some of the greatest known unknowns ever known. And those are women of color who have done so many fabulous things in life that we should be proud of because I certainly am. So what I'll start by doing, let me show you this handbag, this wonderful handbag that we've named in honor of Ellen Craft today. It's a red clutch bag. Look at the leather on this bag. Isn't that fabulous? It's red leather, black leather, and it's not a red red, it's a wine color more or less. And it has a red and black snake skin on the sides of it. Many different flavors in here. This would be the front flap of the bag. This would be the back of the bag. As you carry your bag, your hand actually goes into a hideaway slot in the bag. To support the carrying of it that's how that's done so when you're walking with your bag your bag is always going wherever you go look at that of course you can carry your bag like this and other ways under your arm whatever suits you the most but just in case you have a backup in this bag the bag has a zipped closure by ya. It's nice and deep. I'll take out the infamous tissue paper. You see the bag is fully lined. It has two pockets. It has one leather shaped pocket there and the other pocket would be on this side. Okay. The little tissue paper back in there. While the bag stands well while I'm showing you the bag. Zip it back close. Put your hand back in the bag. Flap it over. And from that point on, your bag is nothing but conversation for all. They're just going to love it. Look at that bag. Gorgeous bag. Gorgeous bag. Ellen Crabb. Ellen Crabb happened to be a very light-complected sister that was born in Georgia. She was born a little bit outside of Savannah, and she was born when? I think that was about in 1826 that she gave birth, that she was born. And the ironic thing about it, because she was so light-complected, her father's master, she, they wanted her, well, people thought actually that she was part of their family of her father's master. The mistress, of course, was very upset about it, so she decided to pack her up and move her away. <laughs> they didn't want to mistake her as a family member, of course. They actually took her to Macon, and in Macon, that's where she was given away at the age of 11. And that's also where she met her first, her first and only husband, who was William Craft. That's how she developed the name, of course, as Ellen craft and one thing she always believed that she hated to have seen so many other children separated from their parents in this cruel manner that under the wretched system of American slavery it appeared to fill her very soul with horror so she had always said she would never give birth to children as long as she was enslaved as time had gone on in life her and her husband decided that they would the Great Escape, and that's actually what they're known for, is the Great Escape. She dressed as a man. She made her first pair of pants she had never sewn before. He made a wig for her, and they made her look just like a man. They put her arm in a bandage, 
and they told her not to speak because she wasn't well read or nor could she she read she couldn't read at all actually because they weren't educated they got in a train he traveled as the side person the slave to his master once sitting on the train she realized across the aisle from her was a gentleman who had been at her master's house the night prior for dinner and he would certainly recognize her because she had served him what she did was pretend to be deaf he kept trying to get her attention and she kept just ignoring him finally he tapped her and she looked over and said mm -hmm, oh, mm -mm, and to let him know that she didn't speak any english well fortunately or she couldn't understand more fortunately they got away like that they took the train they rode up and they made it up to the north they got off in boston once they're in Boston, they decided to mingle with some other abolitionists that were up there. They got, they became educated more. They learned to read and write a little bit, and they started actually being like a, um, hey, anti-slave people. They fought for freedom. They fought for other slaves to get away, to do what they could do. Then, unfortunately, they found out they were being traced by the former slave master. He had sent some slave catchers to Boston to find them, so they were running again. They packed by land, they made it into they made it to Maine. Then they went on and they got a boat. And from the boat they went to Nova Scotia. From Nova Scotia they finally got made it to Halifax, Halifax England. Once in England they changed their lifestyle because they were then free. And they realized the difference in being in America and as opposed to being in England. Because people in England helped them. They couldn't believe the horrendous stories they were telling them. So they helped them out a great deal, as that would say. You know, and so actually what had happened is that she then, of course, she began to give birth to her first child. As things, as freedom came on, because they went, they continued their education and completed their education while they were in England. In 1852, she gave birth to her first son, which followed by four others in their future. By 1868, after being so very successful with their lives in England, that they actually returned back to the United States with two of their children. Okay? And they went back to Savannah. And she opened up an industrial school for colored children. She wrote a book. Actually, the book was written in England and published in England. And it was called Running a Thousand Miles of Freedom. She then, she went on as a free woman. She said when she was in England, she would rather starve as a free woman in England than be a slave for the best man that ever breathed upon the American continent. In 1890s, Ellen made her home with her daughter, who had married a physician and later he became the United States Minister to Liberia. Teach a child, and so they shall go, we'll say. She later died in Charleston, South Carolina in 1897, and by the request, she was then buried under her favorite tree on her own Georgia plantation. They were so successful over the years, I have so much more to say about what happened with, the, uh, with Ellen and William Craft. They had a wonderful life after that. I have so much to say, but in such a short amount of time, I'm only giving you a little brief story about it. I suggest you research it, get that knowledge, share that knowledge, because we know whose shoulders we've stood on, and we're some powerful sisters. I want to thank you once again, and hope that you visit with us again and again. Don't forget to subscribe to Handle the Handbags and stop in and see us. Thanks again, and have a wonderful remainder of a day. Good day.